Um, so today we're going to talk about 2.6, and it's really not super long, this section, okay? There is more stuff in this section, but we're only doing like part A for this unit. And then when we get to the next unit, then we'll do the other part of this section. Um, but for now, we're only going to be doing the combinations of functions, which are basically you're going to add two functions together, subtract them from one another, multiply them together, or divide them. Okay. Um, and so they'll talk about like how it is that you do that at the very beginning, and then they'll give us an example, and then they'll ask us to do a practice. Now, I really don't like that there's just one example, so I'm glad that I go through the practices with y'all. <laughs> because there really are two kinds of problems in here. Um, there's one example, which is where they give you an actual number to evaluate. And then there's another kind where they don't give you what you need to evaluate. So let me talk about it first and I'll explain what I mean by those two different kinds of problems, okay? So for the arithmetic combinations, you're literally just add, subtract, multiply, you're dividing everything together. Now. Um, like for instance, there's a, where do they have it? They don't even have the rules here. They do not. Okay. So the rules are, is that if you're doing, if you see this notation, F plus G in parentheses with an X, what that means is you need to take the F function and add the G function to it. Okay. If you see the notation F minus G, that just means take the f function and then subtract the g function, right? Pretty straightforward. If you see f and g together, that means multiply. So you have this times this guy. And then finally, if you see the fraction, pay special attention to who's in the top and who's in the bottom because that matters, right? So f was in the top and g was in the bottom. So just put the f function at the top and put the g function at the bottom, okay? For adding, subtracting, for adding, you really don't need to do anything other than combine your like terms, right? Because that plus sign is not going to change any of the signs in the G polynomial or whatever it looks like, whatever G looks like. It's not going to change the signs to any of those terms. So you're just essentially combining like terms. However, when you're subtracting, if the G function does have more than one term, you will have to distribute that minus to everybody inside G, okay? We'll see an example in a little bit. When you're multiplying, depending on what F and G look like, whether they're monomials or binomials or trinomials, you might need to either, if they're just two monomials, you could just multiply them together, right? But if you've got like a monomial and a binomial, you have to distribute it. If you have a binomial times a binomial, you'll have to foil that out, right? So it just depends on what's there on how you actually multiply it out, okay? The division is usually the easiest one because you literally stick one function over the other. And if they can factor and if they can reduce, then you would do it. But most times, almost all times, you can't. So you literally just stick one on the top, one on the bottom, and you got it, okay? So not too bad. So for the first um, like example that they're giving us, they tell us that the F function is 2x minus 3. They tell us that the g function is x squared minus 1. And they want us to find all four. The sum, which means to add. Difference, which means subtract. Product, which means multiply. And then quotient, which means divide, right? So the first one they're doing is this f plus g. And so they're taking the f function and they're adding the g function. Now notice, every time they plug in a function, just like the numbers, every time you plug something in, you always should put it in parentheses. Get in that habit, because if you don't, you can have wrong answers because you didn't do something that you should have done, okay? And you wouldn't know if there's no parentheses. So when they plug F in, we know the expression for F is 2X minus three, but just notice it's in its parentheses because you plugged it in, right? And then when you plugged in the expression for G, we're plugging in this for G, but again, they're putting it into parentheses. Now, as long as there's no coefficients in the front and there's no exponents right here, you can just drop those exponents parentheses, okay? 
So no coefficient, no exponent means I don't need these parentheses. I could just write 2x minus 3. The same thing here. It's a plus. A plus 1 is not going to change anything, is it? And a power is no, there's no power there. So it's literally just plus positive x squared and a negative 1 there. Okay. And then if I combine my like terms, there's only 1x squared. That's this guy. We have 2x, which is this guy. But then you have these like terms, right? The constants. And so you combine those, and that's where they ended up with that negative 4. Okay. So it's not too, too bad. It's just plugging it in, get rid of the parentheses when you can, and then combine your like terms, okay? Subtraction is very, very similar. Subtraction does have an extra step though, and they skipped it. So here it's like they were doing F minus G of X. So they plugged in the F function, they plugged in the G function, but this time you do have something that you have to distribute because that negative will change things up, okay? So you do have to distribute this minus sign. So I'll still have two X minus three, but now I will have negative X squared and a positive one, okay? And once they do that, here's the negative X squared, there's the positive two X, and then negative three plus one is where they get this minus two from. Okay, so you do have to distribute that negative. For multiplying, it's the same thing. They plugged in the F in parentheses, they plugged in the G in parentheses, but you do have a binomial, right? There's two terms here, times another binomial, something else with two terms. And when you have that, you do have to foil it out or distribute it out. So if you take this times this, that's where the 2x squared come, came from. I'm sorry, 2x cubed. Then if you take 2x minus 1, that's where this term came from. So for me personally, I would have got this. And then now I move on to the negative 3. And then I move on to that one and I get positive three. And all they did was just rearrange it so that it's in the right order, right? They put the cubes first, then the squares, then the x's, and then the constants. Okay. Their answer is equivalent to mine. If I were to type this answer in to WebAssign, it would accept it. This is just not the formal way to write it at the end. You always want to have the powers descending. So powers going from three, two, one, none. Okay, but both of these are completely equivalent and acceptable answers. The quotient, you do just take the F function and put it in the numerator, and you take the G function and you put it in the denominator. Here they did not use parentheses because you already have a separator, which is that division bar, right? So they didn't put the 2x plus 3 in the parent or 2x minus 3 in the parentheses, and they didn't put an x squared minus 1 in parentheses when they plugged them in because you have that bar there. Now, normally you would try to factor the bottom and see if it cancels with anything, but you can't factor 2x minus 3. And that doesn't match with any of these factors, does it? So it doesn't reduce. I mean, you could try to reduce it, but this one doesn't. Okay. So if it doesn't, then that's just the way it stays. It just stays exactly like that, okay? Now we do know that if I were to plug in a one in here, or if I were to plug in a negative one in there, I would get a zero denominator with my, right? Which is the reason of why they have this statement over here on the side, okay? And that's really the only case when you have the fraction where you have like the special information over there. Okay, I'm gonna cross over. Are you still writing? No? Okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that fraction because of that special little restriction that it had on the side. So it says the domain of arithmetic com combination functions consists of all real numbers that are in common with the domains of F and G. 
This is what it means in math symbols. It means the domain of F union the domain of G. So if I put all these numbers together, oh, I'm sorry, not union. It says they have to have it in common. In common is not the union. Union is just everybody put together. What they have in common is the intersection. I don't know if you've seen that symbol before, but it means the intersection. It means what the two domains have in common. Okay, so that is going to be the domain of F plus G, the domain of F minus G, and the domain of F times G. However, for the fraction, the domain of F over G is going to be the domain of F intersect with the domain of G, what the two guys have in common, right? But you're going to take out wherever G of X equals zero. So you basically remove from that domain anything that will make the denominator zero. So I'm going to go back to the previous example, and I'm going to show you how to find all the domains of those guys, OK? Because in your homework and in some of these practice problems, they do ask us that information. Not only do they want us to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, but then they'll ask me what the domains are for each one, OK? So for domains, in general, when I'm trying to figure out domains, um, you're essentially, your domain is always going to be from negative infinity to infinity, except for when you have two things. One is the square root, right? And the other one is you have a fraction, right? If you have x's downstairs, you need to kick out the guys that make the downstairs zero, okay? So let's go back and see what our functions look like. So here were our functions that they gave us at the very beginning. I could tell you that the domain of f is going to be all real numbers because there's no fractions or radicals in this function, is there? So I could plug anything in, multiply it by two, subtract three, and I will get the number back out, right? So that's why that's the domain. For G, it's the same thing because all you're doing is squaring and then minusing one, right? No fractions, no square roots. So the domain is the exact same thing, negative infinity to infinity. So then what do those two intervals have in common? Well, they're exactly the same, aren't they? So they have everything in common. They have the whole negative infinity to infinity in common, right? So then this is actually going to be my domain for the subtraction. It's going to be my domain for the addition. And it's going to be my domain for the multiplication. The division is something totally different, OK? Now, we cheated a little bit because they gave us this right here at the side. Let me get rid of this. They showed us that if they put the F over the G, that X could not equal plus or minus one, right? This is not going to be given to you, though, when you're doing your homework, right? So we need to learn how to put this information together with the G not equaling zero. So basically, what you have to do is you have to take your denominator and set it not equal to zero. And so I'm gonna say x squared minus one cannot equal zero. And you just solve it like you would a regular equation. So I get x squared cannot equal one. And when I take the square root, I get x cannot equal plus or minus the square root of one, which means x cannot equal plus or minus one, which is what they got, right? But now we know how they got it, okay? So my domain is supposed to be negative infinity to infinity, but I have to take these two numbers out because those two numbers are not allowed, right? So it's essentially you have from negative infinity to infinity, but here's negative one and here's one, and you can't have those in your domain. So you're basically gonna put a little hole around the negative one and a little hole around the positive one. And now that's your new domain. So the domain of f over g is going to be this region over here, which is negative infinity to negative 1. 
And because it's open, it's going to be a parenthesis. Remember, it cannot equal positive or negative one, right? So it should not have a bracket. Bracket is only if it can equal, okay? Then you've got this middle section in here, which would be negative one to one. And then you've got this section over here to the right, which would be one to infinity, okay? So it's almost the same as the other guy's domains. You just had to take these two numbers out of the picture, okay? That one's going to be the hardest one out of all the domains. Okay, I'm gonna go now to our first, this is supposedly is the first actual example. If you go here, they're just saying the same thing I said, right? Didn't I write that down already, right? They're just putting it here. I don't know why they wouldn't give this to you first, but whatever. These books are backwards sometimes. I can't wait to get my PhD so I can <laughs> write it the right way. Oh. Okay, so for example one, they're giving us two functions again. Notice they're a little bit different, right? This time you have one that's a, a linear and you have a quadratic, but there's three terms this time now, right? The other one only had two terms. So it says, um, given that f is this and g is this, find f plus g of x, then, and only then, so after the fact, then evaluate the sum when x equals three, okay? So if I'm gonna do f plus g, that means I have to do f of x plus g of x. So they plugged in the f function, put the plus sign, plugged in the g function. There's really no need for a parentheses in the first one because there's no exponent and no coefficient. If you think of this as a positive one coefficient, it's not gonna change anything. That's still a positive x squared, a positive two x and a negative one. Right. And then if I combine my like terms, I have this x squared here. 2x plus 2x is going to give me that 4x. And then positive 1 minus 1 actually cancel each other out. Right. And so then this is the expression that you get for f plus g. Okay. But then it says then evaluate that sum when x is equal to 3. So we're basically just plugging in three for x. And so you plug in three here and you plug in three there. And so they've got that here. And then I guess you get what, nine plus 12? And that's where they got 21, okay? So this is what I meant by there's two different kinds of problems. Sometimes they'll ask you for this by itself and they'll have a number right there already, okay? You can do the problem a little bit faster if they give you that number, this number in the parentheses, okay? If they don't give you the number, it's like this, and then you have to do it algebraically, where you have to plug in the whole function, plug in the whole function, and then simplify it, okay? Whereas there's another way to do this, and I'm actually gonna show you that other way, okay? Instead of doing, Let's pretend that they never asked us to do the one with the x. Let's pretend they just asked us to find this, okay? Then that would mean I would have to do f of three plus g of three, right? According to the rule of what this means, it means to write it like that. And then basically all that means is plug three into f. If I plug three right here, what do I get? Six plus one, which is seven, is that right? And what happens if I plug three into G? I get nine plus six, which is 15, minus one, which is 14. And what do you get when you do seven plus 14? That same 21, don't you? Okay. So you can do them like this if they give you the number inside, okay? It's okay to do it like this. But if they don't give you a number on the inside and it's just an X, you do have to do it with the whole functions. You can't just plug in numbers, okay? But those are the two kinds of problems that you'll see. One where they'll give you a number to plug in, and then ones where they won't give you a number to plug in. It just says X, and that's it, okay? So for this one, I want you to try it. Try it first, and then, and then we'll, we'll do it as a class. 
I'm going to pause the recording so that way it doesn't. So yes, they were asking us to do f plus g of negative six. So I wrote it like this. People do it differently sometimes. Sometimes they might do this computation off to the side, and then they'll do this computation off to the side, and then just add them at the end. And that is OK to do as well, OK, if that's the way you do it in your paperwork. I just like to keep it you know, all together. So if it says f negative 6 plus g of negative 6, I basically put these brackets and plug negative 6 into f, and that's what you see here, OK? Then I plug negative 6 into g, and that's what you see here. And then it's just a matter of computing. So when I computed f of negative 6, I got negative 3 after everything was said and done, right? When I was finding g of negative 6, I got actually 34 at the end after everything was said and done. And so when you add those two guys together, that was when we got to 31, OK? So again, you don't have to write it the way I wrote it, but you could if you wanted to. Essentially, what you need to do is you need to find f of negative 6 and put that number here. You need to find g of negative 6, put that number there, and then just add them together. Okay. Go ahead and try number two. Okay, so for this one, when they're back to back like that, right, it means to multiply. So you have to take f of 8 times g of 8. So I plug 8 into f in this first bracket, and I got 11. And then I plug 8 into the g function, and eventually I got 62, right? And then when you multiply them together, we ended up with this as the final answer, okay? It's nice when there's numbers in there. When they start just putting x and no number, and then they ask you for domains, that's when it gets a little bit harder. But for the most part, the section's not too bad. Okay. So of course, you might, if you're using the papers, you might want to change that to number three. That's a typo. Um, I actually want you to do an extra part that the computer, or when I created these things, I didn't, it didn't ask you for this. But I want you to actually do this first. What is the domain of all of these three, right? Because they're all the same domain, right? Then after you have that, then tell me what's the domain of the fraction. Okay. Before I do domains, notice that the domain business is always at the end, right? You always do the algebraic part first, and then you do your domain stuff later, okay? So I'm going to do part A first. And this one says to do F plus G. So that means the F function plus the G function. So it means 2X plus 1 plus the x squared minus 15. In the first parentheses, there's no coefficient and there's no exponent, so I do not need those parentheses. In the second parentheses, there's no exponent, but there is sort of a coefficient of positive one, isn't there? And if I distribute that positive one, nothing really changes. It stays a positive x squared and it stays a negative 16. So then if I combine my like terms, I end up with I'm gonna put an equal sign there. I end up with positive x squared, positive 2x, and a negative 15. And so that would be the response for A. F plus G. Now for B. This one says f minus g. So that means the f function minus the g function. So the f function is again 2x plus 1. The g function is the x squared minus 16. No coefficient and no exponent, so no parentheses needed. Here we don't have an exponent, but we do have a coefficient of a negative 1. And so we do have to distribute that. So that would make it negative x squared and then positive 16. And if we combine those like terms, you still have a negative x squared. You still have a positive 2x. I'll be positive 17.
then for part C, this one is F times G. So it's the F function times the G function. And if I put the F function in parentheses and then put the G function in parentheses, you do have a binomial, right? Times another binomial. So you do have to foil it out or distribute, whichever word you use, the same thing. So 2X times X squared is 2X cubed. 2X times a negative 16 is negative 32X. Then now distribute the one. I get positive X squared and a negative 16. Now, none of those are like terms. We've got cubed, regular X's, X squared, and then constants, right? They're all completely different. You could say this is your answer, but you could also arrange it so that it's in the correct order. So I would have to have my cubes first, then my X squared, then my regular X's, and then finally my constant. This is the more formal way to write that answer. Okay, then the last one, it's F over G. So it's literally the F function over the G function. So in this case, two X plus one over the X squared minus 16. Now I know that this one's gonna factor into X plus four and X minus four, but will that reduce with this factor up here? It won't, they're not the same, right? So there's really no point in trying to reduce it because we know now it's not going to reduce. So this is the actual answer for the fraction part. You would always try to factor your numerator and factor your denominator to see if it does reduce. Every now and then they'll throw one in there that can. So don't forget to try it, okay? Okay, um, now we're gonna move on. I'm gonna do part F first because I wanna do that and then the domain for the G, F over G. So for F, the domain of F plus G, all of these guys, the domain of this guy, the domain of that guy, and the domain of the product, all are the same thing. It's the domain of F alone intersected with the domain of G alone, okay? We just need to go figure out what the heck is the domain of F and the domain of G so that we can figure out what they have in common, right? So what is the domain of F? Look at the function there. Does it have any radicals or, or fractions? F does not have any radicals or fractions. So what's the domain if it doesn't have those? automatically all real numbers. So everything, negative infinity all the way to positive. What about G? Does G have any of those interesting situations happening? A radical or a fraction? No, so that one's gonna have the same domain. And so then what do these two intervals have in common? Well, they're the exact same thing. So they have everything in common, right? So it's just negative infinity to infinity. And that's the actual answer for F. Now for E, we're trying to do the domain of F over G. And that is the same as what you just found, but you have to take out where G equals zero. Okay, you have to remove any numbers that make G equal to zero. And why G? Because G is in the denominator, right? It's the denominator stuff that cannot equal zero. So I already know what this is. So I'm basically gonna have negative infinity to infinity, but then I've got to take out some numbers and I don't know what those numbers are, okay? Let's go see what they are. If I set G equal to zero, that means X squared minus 16 equals zero. Right, was it that G? Go back to the top, yeah. X squared minus 16. 
And so then if I solve this, you could do it two ways. You could factor it, set each factor equal to zero, or you can just extract roots. How you solve that is up to you. I like to extract roots when I can. Oh, so I get these two answers, plus or minus four, right? So then the numbers I'm supposed to remove are negative four and four, just these single numbers. I like to draw the image, not everyone does, but I do. But if here's negative four and here's four and everything is supposed to be an answer, but not these two guys. So all of that is the answer, all of this is the domain and all of that is the domain. So what does that mean? In negative infinity to negative four, negative four to four, and then four to infinity. This is the domain. So this chunk is represented by that first interval. The middle chunk is represented by the middle interval. And then the right chunk is represented by this interval over here. Okay. Now let's go look at the homework just to see if there's anything that's weird or different that we haven't discussed, okay? If they are all like the stuff we discussed, then we're good. If not, we'll talk about something extra. Okay, so let me go to the 2.6a. Again, there will be a 2.6b, but that's not until the next unit, not on this test, okay? When is this test? On Monday, good. Do we come to class tomorrow? No, what are we supposed to do tomorrow? Homework. Okay, so it says two functions f and g can be combined by arithmetic operations of, what are the four arithmetic operations we talked about? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, one more, and division, that's it. And so then this is one of those ones, we have done one like that. We did it with a negative six, right? They're putting in a negative eight, but try it with these functions. Here they're plugging in five, but what are they doing when they're done? Subtracting. Here they're plugging in six, but then what are they doing with the results? Multiplying. And then here, plugging in twos, plug in two here, two here, but then you're going to do what with the results? Divide them. And then this one we did talk about. So we did do um, where you add them, subtract them, multiply them, divide them, you can do all that. And it does ask you the domain of F over G. So just set G equal to zero and remove that from the common domain. What's gonna be the common domain? All real, because this one's all real and that one's all real, right? So the common one is all real, and then just take out the guy that's gonna make G equal to zero, okay? Same thing with this one, you're gonna add them together, subtract them, only combine like terms when you add them to track. Don't try to add stuff that does not belong together, okay? Just write them all out, okay? Then the multiplying, which you are gonna to have to distribute that X squared, and then the dividing, again, the same thing. What is the common um, interval there? all reals. And so just take out the one guy that makes the G zero. And I know it's one guy because this is a linear, isn't it? Okay. How many guys am I going to have to remove on this one? Right, because this one has a power of two, right? Now, this one's going to be a little bit different. I think I might want to talk about that one because this is not all real numbers like all the other problems, is it? Okay. And then down here, the same thing. This one's not going to have all real like what we're used to, okay? So it looks like those are the last two problems. So I'll talk about the domain portion of these two problems. I'm not gonna do the adding and subtracting and multiplying dividing. Just FYI, only like terms, right? Is a radical a like term like those regular numbers in F? Radicals are not the same as regular numbers, right? So when you have to add this radical or subtract this radical, just leave it there, okay? It's not gonna combine with anything. Okay, so let me see. I don't have any extra 
little paper. Okay, so I'm gonna write F is X squared plus three and G. Now again, I'm not going to do all of the combinations. I'm just gonna do the domains because that's the hard part, okay? So what is the domain of F here? All real. There's no fraction and no radical, so it's all real. What is the domain of G here? This one's harder. You actually have to compute it. Right, whatever's on the inside has to be greater than or equal to zero. Good. And so then if I solve this, I'm gonna minus nine, still have negative X. And then I'm gonna divide by negative one coefficient, right? So I get X and nine, but because I divided by a negative, this guy flips over, right? You learned that? So then I actually have X is less than nine, which means negative infinity to nine. And it has an equal, so it does have a bracket. So what do those two intervals have in common? Negative infinity up to what? Up to nine, exactly. Because this one does have nine in there, doesn't it? So if I'm going to do the intersection, which is what they have in common, it's going to be that negative infinity to nine. And that's all they have in common. Because this guy doesn't have anything after the nine, does he? So if this is going to be your domain for the addition, for the subtraction, and even for the multiplication, it's just not what you're going to use for the division, okay? Remember for the division, you have to take that negative infinity to nine, but then you need to take out where G equals zero, okay? So where in the world does G equal zero? G is this guy, right? And so if I square both sides, I'll have nine minus X still equal to a zero. And then if I minus nine, or you could have added X either way, divide by negative one, I get X equals nine. So I have to take the nine out of this interval. And you use these brackets when you're talking about one single number, just FYI, because I used them on the last problem and you're probably wondering like, why didn't I use parentheses and brackets? Because when it's just one single person, you use the braces. When it's a group of numbers from here to here, that's when you use the parentheses and the brackets, okay? So then what would the interval look like if it's this interval, but I have to take out the nine? Exactly, it turns that nine into a nine, but with the parentheses, because you can't have the nine now, right? So the nine is out. I could go all the way up to the nine, I just can't have the nine as part of my group. Okay, so that was a good example for, I think it was number nine, if I'm not mistaken. I forgot the number of the problem. Number nine, okay, good. So that would be how you do the domain for the F over G for number nine, okay? Now your problem might be a little different. It might have different numbers here and here, but it should be pretty similar, okay? So for number 10, that one had something like, let me go see real quick, X, okay. I just wanna make sure it's just X. X over X plus five and G was X cubed. So I'm gonna have to first figure out what their individual domains are before I can figure out what they have in common. This one's easier. What's the domain of G? Mm-hmm. No fraction, no radical. It's negative infinity to infinity automatically. This one though does have a fraction. So I can't have what number in the denominator? Correct. 
So this x plus five bismuth cannot equal zero, right? So if I minus five on both sides, it turns out that x cannot equal a negative five, because that would make it zero, right? So how do I say everything can be part of the domain, just not negative five? How do I write that as an interval? Everything is good, just not the negative five. I like to draw graphs. Not everyone does, but I do. <laughs> I say here's negative five and I cannot have that guy. So there's a hole there, but I can have everything else, right? So I can have all of these numbers and I can have all of those numbers in my domain, just not the negative five. Once I have that picture, it's easier, right? Go ahead, what do you think it is, intervals? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. To infinity, because it would be from here to here, right? And this guy always gets a parentheses. What should I put on the negative five slope? Should I put brackets? Am I allowed to equal negative five? I am not allowed to equal negative five. So it should be the parentheses. Okay, good, good. Frederick had it. Okay, so then what do the two things have in common then? They're pretty much the same thing, aren't they? It's just this one has a number taken out, right? So they're gonna have that in common. So if I wanna find the intersection, it is going to be this one. This is a smaller interval than that one. I know it looks longer, <laughs> but it's actually a small thing, a number. And that one has all the numbers, right? This one's missing somebody though. So we're gonna go with that as our intersection. Okay, but they're going to ask us for the domain of F over G, okay? And so that's gonna be this interval, right? Minus where the G equals zero. So it will be this whole interval right here. You just have to take out maybe some more numbers, right? So G is actually X cubed, right? Let me write this first. G equal to zero means X cubed equals zero. And how do you solve for X here? Not the power, it already has a power, but the root, the third root, right? So when you take that third root, it makes this power go away. And the third root of zero is still zero. If you don't believe me, you can type it in your calculator, right? You still get zero, okay? So I have this interval, but now I gotta take out another person, don't I? I'm gonna use this graph here because I already have, since I already have the graph of that, now I gotta take out a zero. So I'm gonna put zero over here. It would be over here, right? compared to negative five, but I gotta take it out, which means now I gotta put a little open dot around him. So that's gonna change my domain, isn't it? Okay, so my domain of F over G is gonna be this section, which is negative infinity to negative five, then the middle section, negative five to zero, and then the right section, which would be zero to infinity. And so this one had two numbers essentially that had to get taken out. Okay. But I wanted you to have those as an example because otherwise you would have been there like trying to figure that one out, right? Like, no, why is it not working? Okay, and so that will help you with the domains for number 10. So hopefully you can um, get through that. Now, if you've been keeping up with the homework and you're thinking, well, I don't really need Wednesday off because I'm already caught up, that's you. <laughs> Not everyone is in that same boat. 
but I would suggest maybe try to use kind of have a head start on what to expect on that review. So when we talk about it in class, you have like targeted questions already because you know exactly where you were having trouble. Okay. Does that make sense? But other than that, we finished pretty early today, like a whole hour early. I'll still be here. <laughs> if you want to stay here and do something, you can, but I'll be here. Other than that, you guys are dismissed for the day. And I will not see you until Thursday. Okay. And we'll talk about the review of the class.